Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the NET uh, training. And we are glad to have you here. Uh, we are glad that you want to know about the new NET. So I will first give some logistic information to you, and then we will start with the schedule. So um, first of all, you might have already seen that we are recording this event. So please feel free to switch off your camera if you don't want to be recognizable. Uh, because we want to make it publicly available after this event. Of course, we will edit a little bit, but uh, you are free to um, switch off your camera. So, and the second important part is we are taking the question from with the collaborative document. You all might have should have inform uh, got the email from me with the collaborative document link. I have pasted it on the Zoom chat again. Uh, we are we are not taking any question on the Zoom chat because it's it sometimes it's very hard to um, coordinate with these questions on the Zoom. So please ask your hosting questions on the HDoc uh, collaborative document. Uh, everyone can edit without logging in. Uh, this I'm sharing the document. So how to edit this? Here on left uh, top left you could see the. Uh, pen button or pencil icon, you go here and uh, go top bottom of the page and ask your questions. Any question related to this, you can ask and our team will answer it. And during the session, we will take some important questions for discussion as well. And you can go back to view mode after you edit questions and uh, this will be continuously updating. And one important uh, information about the code of conduct uh, that we follow Carpentries code of conduct in uh, at Enris in all our training events that uh, specifically means we are being respe respectful to each other and use uh, friendly and uh, friendly language when we type something and being uh, res uh, respectful to each other is the most important part of the code of conduct. Um, so I want to inform that this training event is organized and hosted by the preparation for operational working group of NERD, who we were working since a couple of months to prepare the machine for production and migrating your data. And you will meet all of us and the NERD expert at NRIS uh, at this event. And I wish that you ask a lot of questions that uh, challenge us to answer, and we will publish these questions afterwards this event as well. So you don't need to put any uh, names. It, uh, anonymous questions are welcome. And any questions are welcome regarding the net. So uh, we will have an introduction roundup. Uh, my name is Tanya. Uh, I'm training coordinator at Enris, also was a member of the POWG team. From me, you might have uh, got many emails. So we have all our POWG uh, members here. We will have a roundup uh, introduction first before we go with the schedule. And um, I will ask Francesca to give an introduction to start with this. Are you here? Yes, I'm here. Can you yeah. hear me? Can you give an introduction, Francisca? We'll have an in introduction roundup. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, should I start? Uh, I guess uh, I'm not really sure I can share. So, not if, now. Uh, uh, probably you... we will have an introduction roundup. All the POW ah. will have to say something and we can. Ah, okay, okay. So, yeah, so my name is Francesca and I work in Sigma 2. I'm responsible for uh, the storage, the national storage services uh, offered by Enris. So this means the uh, near the storage and all the services that sit on top of near. Thank you. And Laurent? Yes, uh, good morning. My name is Laurent Santoni. I'm a senior advisor working at Sigma2, uh, working with uh, storage and related services. And uh, I've been part of the core team uh, in the project preparing the new need infrastructure for, for operations. And um, yeah. 
Thank you. Um, Thierry? Hello, my name is Thierry Toutain. I'm working at the University of Oslo in the HPC group, and I am uh, operating the near storage and uh, the near toolkit service platform. Yeah, thanks, Didi. Asad? Hi, my name is uh, Sarda Halifu. I work at the University of Oslo in HPC team. Uh, in the near project, um, I worked as a technical coordinator, and uh, you might also uh, contacted me via the support cases. I do different supports on HPCs and the near and the everything related. Thank you. Thank you, Sarda. Andreas? Hello, my name is Andreas Calvo, and I work at NTNU with the HPC infrastructure team. I also been working with the near group setting up the system um transfer data thank you city hey yeah so i'm uh, siri carlo i work at uib it department and i'm working with the uh, nail toolkit and i was not involved in the uh, setting the new system in operations Thank you, Siri. Uh, I guess uh, Adil is here or not? No. We will have uh, one uh, from research data archive team. Uh, Adil will present afternoon, but he will introduce himself uh, later. So I uh, will stop sharing, but please ask your question. I have some question you asked during the uh, registration. We will take it during the event. And uh, I'll as per the schedule, Francesca will give a uh, history, talk about the nerd legacy. Am I sharing? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, good. Uh, so I will, um, yes, this is about uh, NERD, and I will give you a little bit of uh, an introduction of, uh, from where NERD come from. Uh, a little bit of history and maybe the current uh, near the, how it was born, the new near the, and what we expected the new near the, to become. So if you can move on. More detail in the agenda is, uh, as I said, history, then the concept of near, then why we have a new near today. Then uh, how we have been procuring the new NIRD, and then the NIRD in production as of today, and all the other services that sit on NIRD. Uh, I think I have something like half an hour. Uh, I don't know, Dania, uh, do you open up for question or not? Uh, we can have a question uh, if. Uh... If there is something in, in, the, in the chat, maybe. However, yeah, I don't follow the chat, but uh, you can, uh, Dania, uh, stop me if there is a question which I have to address. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so uh, next history first. Uh, next. So maybe I was, I don't know uh, how. How do you know about the history of Sigma and Andres and but okay in the early 2000 and early year 2000 let, let's see let's say uh, there were several HPC machines located at the both universities uh, but these machines were not uh, so to say. Uh, under the same umbrella. They were owned and operated and the resources are located by each university. But then it became very clear that uh, the digital uh, digital world, the, the digital needs in research was uh, going to explode very soon. And so in order to have bigger machine, there was the need uh, of a strong collaboration. And that's why around, yeah, by the end of the first decades of 2000, uh, so Sigma, the Sigma was established. And this Sigma was 
given the task of allocating HPC resources that were, let's say, given by the HPC by the IT department at the, the H, uh, uh, at the universities. They had their own HPC infrastructure and they were giving part of it to the national resources. Uh, they were also kind of exchanging uh, uh, a little bit of support, although at the time it was not yet called Meta Center, but was soon to be called Meta Center. Um, but then it was even more clear by the time that. First of all, um, we would have had better and bigger machine if the four oldest university would have bought the machine together. And this was clear. You get uh, you get more for if you if you buy a big a bigger machine. You get more for the money. Uh, it was also clear that. Uh, HPC is not enough. There was the need for a national donut. So the North Door was established. At that time, around 2012, North Door had just a uh, few petabytes in total uh, distributed between disk and tape at the University of Oslo and a little bit at the University of Toronto. So this is a little bit of a history. And then in 2015, a national working group uh, consisting of people from the, the, the Bot University and the Research Council put in place a, a, an idea of how uh, the national e-infrastructure could be procured and operated. And this gave room for the establishment of Sigma 2. Yes, you can move on. So from 2015, we have the so-called Sigma 2. Sigma 2 gets funding from the, the Norwegian Research Council and the Bot University to procure and operate the national infrastructure. But uh, it doesn't do it alone. It does it by in cooperation with the Bot University that put the money, but put also the competencies. And that's uh, and their network of competencies that in fact operated the infrastructure was at the time called Meta Center and was formed by um, IT, uh, from, it was formed by the IT department at the four oldest university. So, um, in 2016, we had the first procurement where when Fram and Trumso and near the Trondheim and Trumso were bought and put in production. Then between 2017-19, Sigma uh, Saga was procured and Niet was expanded. In uh, around 2020, we had, we had Betsy in production. Uh, in 2021, we had the new kind of um, renovate uh, uh, scheme of the national collaboration, which is no longer called Meta Center, but it's now Andres. So that's why now we say that uh, uh, Andres operate and offer the infrastructure. Uh, but the, the legal setting, it's still uh, under the uh, responsibility of Sigma or still procure systems. So in 2022, the uh, location, a new location was procured. So we, we move, we, we are going to move from two location into one. I'm going to say something more about this later. And in 2023, the new NIR was set in production. Um, so what is the Sigma 2 strategy? Uh, first of all, the vision of Sigma 2, the reason why Sigma 2 was created is to maximize the impact of Norwegian research by offering 
predictable, cost-effective, and reliable um, and sustainable e infrastructure nationally. So the key areas uh, where, uh, of Sigma 2 action are as, uh, provide advanced computing and data service that uh, fit the user needs. So the user are always in focus and the needs of the user are always in focus, but also facilitate the international um, collaboration by, produce, by providing uh, research service, cloud resources and common components. And also combine the, um, the capability and capacity of different partners involved in the collaboration. Yes, you can move on. So that's uh, more or less how the national infrastructure looks like now. As I said, we had until 2022, we were operating an infrastructure distributed on two plus one location. Why two plus one? Because we had in Tromso, Fran, Fram, and one of the near the disk. In Trondheim, we had uh, Saga, Betsy, and one of the near disk. And then we had uh, some uh, capacity that we bought so we, we have bought from uh, TSD, use it, in order to offer sensitive data um, capability nationally. nationally. So that's uh, also an, a possibility for the uh, national user to um, get access to TSD, uh, TSD resources through the national offer. Uh, but now, just uh, one moment more before I finish uh, on the slide, go back. As I said, in 2022, we have procured a new location. So in the future, uh, these, uh, the all infrastructure is meant to be moved in, uh, in, uh, in the new location, which is not Malloy, it's called uh, the, the actual uh, geographical place is called Nufiorait. Uh, the data center will be in an olivine mine, uh, old olivine mine, and uh, which is, has been adapted to uh, to host the data center. It has a very good capacity and capability in terms of space, in terms of security in terms of uh, electric electricity power cooling system. And last but not least is also green. Um, Sigma 2, this is the ENRIS infrastructure, which has been, which will, is provided to the national user. And this sits on top of the uh, SICT network. Yes, you can move on. So uh, now a little bit uh, focus on NIRD if there are no questions. Good, then uh, research, uh, research in a digital era. I mean, before, as I mentioned, it was all about doing computation on a PC system or, or locally. But then we see that, uh, we have seen that in the digital era, researchers need storage for securely storing, analyzing, and reusing large volume of data, not only for themselves, but all, also to run a collaborative research. So uh, this poses a new challenge to the overall, to the concept of storage. It's not only storage for storing, it's also storage for analyzing, storage for sharing, storage for ensure, uh, ensuring security. Yes. One. So uh, when the, the old near was set up, uh, it was designed to follow uh, what we call the data centric architecture. The idea was quite new at the time, uh, but extremely simple. Uh, the data moving the large volume of data is cumbersome. So 
uh, do not move the data, but, but rather attach service to the data. This is uh, the, uh, in, uh, in summary, the concept of a data-centric architecture. Move on. And that's why the NIAD ecosystem has been built the way it is. So let's say that the, the storage backbone is on the center, and then sitting on top of the storage, there are, there, there are a number of services that are meant to support the researcher in every stage of the research data life cycle. So from data planning to start collecting data, uh, storing data, but also analyzing data um, on HPC system, but also analyze data locally on the cloud infrastructure, uh, data analytics, per and post processing. And finally, when all this has happened, then luckily a researcher is meant to have enough result to be published in a peer review publication, and then it's the time to archive. And the archiving means not only put the data somewhere to get it stored and you forget it, but on the contrary, it should be something that allows the researcher to um, share the data openly with others and possibly get rewarded and reuse it. So all of these are services that sit on the near the backbone. Can we move on? But uh, so what, what is in essence the near the infrastructure? What are the uh, uh, major uh, use case for the near the infrastructure? First of all, uh, the near the infrastructure has a massive volume. Um, it has to provide a massive volume because the data volume is increasing as we uh, will show in a moment. But also it has to produce security. It, it has to provide infrastructure for ensuring security and redundancy of the data that require it. It's meant primarily to store data during active data projects. And, uh, but also it's not only storing for storing, it's also uh, consuming the data for services. It is also meant to allow sharing with collaborators inside your group, inside your institution, across the institution. This without renouncing to the possibility of controlling access to the data. And finally, it has to provide storage, which is perform performant enough to support uh, uh, big data analytics or is very well interfaced to the HPC to allow staging to and from the HPC service. So that's uh, more or less uh, the idea of uh, NIRT. And that's what we have been striving to put in place uh, in the last years. And I think we are very well in, in, uh, in that direction. Uh, so why setting up a new NIRT? You can move on. If you remember, I said that before Sigma 2 was established, so before 2015, we had some few petabytes, actually four, between tape and disk. And yeah. But this, uh, this uh, storage system were quite uh, disconnected from each other. So it was not an ecosystem the way we, I have described now. But still, the, the, we saw that slowly people were starting losing this uh, capacity. This capacity was needed. So we, we can move on. We procured the NIAT. 
the near the which is the one that you all you know you have been experiencing until now these two discs one in Tromso and one in Trondheim so the first two discs were delivered in Tromso and Trondheim in 2016 and then we saw that quickly this uh, capacity was being used so the trend was uh, rather clear the needs for storage is it was there so you can move on. Then we expanded the capacity. We expanded uh, regularly the capacity in, also, in order to have the least amount of unused data, unused storage, but still uh, offering enough storage for the user needs. So we were expanding stepwise until we saw that we were quickly reaching the maximum allowed capacity according to the contract established with the provider in 2016. So this happened in 2019, okay? We saw now we are getting very full. And then we run a, an investigation. We run a, um, in a, a survey asking the user, okay, uh, can you make a prediction, max and mean, minimum and maximum, uh, storage needs from 2020 until 25. And the results was quite impressive. I mean, clearly the storage needs was uh, getting higher and higher in terms of volume. So we started the project, but uh, you can move on. But the, what's is this uh, volume used for? Uh, the most uh, uh, special thing of the near, one of the most special things is, is that it's a, a multi tenant solution for different disciplines. So we don't, uh, we are not offering a storage which is designed for a specific discipline of science. We offer a generic storage and the multi tenant storage. Uh, but uh, you can see already that there are some domain of science that produce quite a lot of, of data, such as geoscience, marine technology, biology, uh, biomedicine, and so on and so forth. Um, those are the primary users for us, but this doesn't mean that, uh, for example, we don't host uh, data from human science, human yora. So uh, one other important thing is that not all the data which are stored or near that are actively used. Quite a large portion of data on near, it's called the data. However, we see also that even if a data set is called, this doesn't mean that it's not worth to be stored. Uh, it is, this is something that again was acquired during the last years. Data might be active, data set might be called, but even the called one had to have some sort of storage solution, storage, uh, yeah, storage solution to be hosted in a more cost-effective way. Yes, and so we started the procurement of the new NIR. In the so-called in the so-called um, NIR 2020 project. Can you hear me still? Yes, yes, Francesca. Yes, okay. Um, the, the requirement for the new need, we, we started the collecting, we started by collecting requirement from uh, uh, different user community. And we saw already a complexity of requirement. So uh, first of all, the user needs active data storage, but also less active data storage as I was mentioning. So uh, called, Let's, let's call it cold data storage. They need also to have a mechanism to back up the data that require security and uh, redundancy. 
they want to have the services connected to data in order to um, consume the data. They want to have high capability uh, with regard to connectivity towards the HPC in order to back to stage back and forth data to the HPC. And last but not least, they want to have access to, to the data through services. Oops. Through services and protocols. So uh, that's the, all these requirements ended up in the tender pro, pro, um, in the procurement and in the tender document that we uh, published in uh, in 21 so you can move on which led to the procurement and the acquisition of the current NIET, which is the first system of the uh, ENRIS system that is delivered and installed in left down mine uh, you see here a NIET is actually sitting on in uh, two container one uh, uh, is called uh, data lake the other one is called tl storage why you can move on because in fact we ended up with two disks uh, into separate location two container one is for performance storage so it has perform uh, it has uh, what we call fresh drive to provide performance to the storage and the other one, what we call data lake, it's a sort of cold storage system, but this cold storage system has also a number of APIs and the number and support the number of access protocol in order to support the different use cases, especially for people who need to access the, and consume this data through services, possibly object oriented um, services. Yes, you can move on. So what are the most relevant use cases for the new NIET? It offers storage for complex data, complex data intensive workflow, such as data analytics, pre and post processing, uh, and artificial intelligence. It has a large volume of storage for uh, research in collaboration ongoing in institution and across institution. It offers storage for backup for uh, uh, institutional storage or edge storage. For example, there are a number of users who are storing data on, uh, on local system like laboratories or observational data or whatever, icebreaker ships, ship, all these things. So this might well have a backup on it. Uh, and it offers also storage for long-term and a carbon and published storage and secure storage. And look, what about the capacity? You can move on. So uh, near this meant to have a capacity which will be will expand. At the moment, it has uh, tw circa twenty petabytes on the TR storage and ten petabytes on the data lake. And later, I guess Lauren uh, will or someone else will uh, tell you more about this capacity how it's distributed and accessed. But uh, near the will increase, and we expect. Uh, the data lake to increase the most over the years because we expect that the amount of data that needs to be shared through services, the cold data, the big volume will increase. Um, you can move on. So the new year in production. I'm quite soon finished. As I said, it has a capacity of circa 30 petabytes as of now. It will scale up to 70 petabytes in a few years from now. Now it's 30. It has storage for cold data. It offers a solution for ensuring security and redundancy, such as backup service from the TR storage to the data lake. Please be aware that the data lake does not have backup. 
and then uh, it, it's, it has also the functionality to uh, do encryption, encryption of the data if this is necessary. It has uh, access, uh, several access protocol and API, in particular on the data lake, will um, will develop and enable a number of object storage APIs. It has uh, a policy engine to uh, to allow granular policies, means what data should be backed up, what data should not be backed up. Uh, who should be access, who should be not, should not have access, and so on and so forth. Ideally, these rules should be defined by the user themselves. So we want to empower the user. And this is the idea, this was the idea, and let's see how, how we go, how far we go in that direction. But I, uh, I am not really, I have big up. Uh, so uh, near the uh, but the new near there's also cloud services. So the service platform and all the services that sit on the service platform has been migrated or are being migrated right now. Yes, a, a quick overview, just a few minutes to uh, say something about the other service, the one services that sit on top of near the and are being migrated. Uh, one of these is the ECDMP for data planning. Then we have the near service platform, which is the Kubernetes cloud. I'll, I'm getting back to this and the research data archive. Those are the Sigma2 services, but we have also a number of user-defined portals. Uh, I mean, portals that has been deployed by the end user and those are being migrated together with the project. Yes, uh, let's move on. Uh, data management planning, just a, a quick look at what this is. It's a system to create, it's a web-based service to create data management plan. And the special things, there are several DMP tools and all of them are good. The special thing of this DMP is that you, you can, with the help of our administrator, you can make a template which is designed on the data management rule your your group your institution has decided you can move on quickly yes that's uh, said then next then we have the near service platform which is the kubernetes infrastructure a kubernetes cloud to deploy services connected to data you can move on so uh, what are the the, what uh, the, the service platform features the uh, CPU and GPU capacity, support the pre post and pre processing uh, platform, uh, support the visualization, big data analytic, artificial intelligence, machine learning workflows, but also provide the platform for having the web services and portal to share data. Yes, and then there is the, on the service platform, we have the near toolkit, which is a platform as a service to deploy on demand tool. We have a mechanism that is called uh, uh, click and install. So you, if you go to the near toolkit, you will see something like this. Then you click on, on, uh, on uh, one of these boxes, you go back. For example, you pick it up and you, you will have it. I guess maybe today you will have also some of this. So, uh, archive again, Adil would say much more about this, but uh, archiving solution is for data that can be openly shared. You can uh, move on. It's, it features long term presentation, open access. It produces a, a persistent identifier connected to, to the data. Uh, data are annotated with a minimal uh, set of metadata and it allows for anonymous download. What is coming next? Uh, go to the next. So the uh, current research data archive has been in production since 2014. And we see that the service is picking up. I mean, 
late we have seen a constant or I would say an exponential increase of the amount of data set that has been deposited per year. Um, this especially in response of the uh, national directive that we are published uh, from uh, uh, the um, Kunskap, the direct directorate, so from the research of and education ministry, uh, saying that all the research data should be made openly accessible after uh, being published. So because of this, people are using a lot uh, the research data archive to publish the data. We have at the moment circa 650 terabytes published in a single replica, and then we have several replica. Uh, we have seen that, that the needs have been changed since 2014. Uh, user needs more fair feature on the archive, more interoperability, and that's why we have been run, we are running now a project which is called Archive 2021 that will uh, make the next generation archive during this year to be in production production ready next year. So stay tuned. This will come very soon. Yes. Yes, I started the presentation. Do you see my slide? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Good. Um, then uh, I will start uh, by saying a couple of words about the uh, collocation. Um, as Francesca was mentioning, so uh, from 22, uh, there is a new collocation, uh, which um, um, NEED started to, I mean, NEED was installed in the, already in the new collocation, and um, this will be the also the collocation for the next, uh, next uh, generation HPC machines as well. Um, here you see um, uh, 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 graphics of um, how the mine looks like. And just for, for your, um, to have a notion basically of, of the size of this um, mine, there is a tiny spot with a truck inside of it. So you, you can imagine the, the size of it. Um, the, um, the new collocation site has green energy, has um, seawater cooling, and um, it's it is um, it is um, basically providing professional services for uh, for NEED. Um, NEED is uh, located in the third level, and that there is going to be a separate area for the upcoming HPC um, system. And you you can see also a little bit of um, yeah. Uh, a graph showing the, the sizes of the uh, holes and the containers and also a truck beside the uh, location. Uh, as it was mentioned before, so the um, operations are um, provided by Andris, uh, which are um, the four oldest universities, uh, Bergen, uh, University of Bergen, University of Oslo, Tromsø and NTNU. Um, and and uh, on-site services are provided by, as mentioned, by the uh, left mine data center. Um, when it comes to connections to the uh, data center, uh, it is connected to the research data network over 100 gigabit. It has redundant connection. Uh, one goes directly to Trondheim and the other to Bergen. And um, and the, the um, connection is completely um, redundant in terms of the whole setup. Um, the systems uh, needed uh, is installed in containers. Here is a, here is a an, um, air view of a container, how the container looks like. But uh, basically, there is capacity for eight racks in single container, um, possibility for 22 kilowatt power for each rack. And uh, it has um, eight liquid cooling um, um, heat exchangers in each container. 
uh, redundant cooling and power. It has automatic fire extinguishing system. Uh, it has a hot and cold aisle setup. And according to the current technology, it, it is actually possible in theory, theory to install up to 80 petabytes in one single container. Um, so yeah, the container uh, looks as it was shown also before, but you, you can see here how a container looks like installed in the container racks and a, a picture taken inside of the container with the needed equipment in it. So just for you to have a notion how the system uh, looks like. So um, the new architecture, as uh, Francesca was mentioning, so it's it's based on um, use cases which we collected during the architecture phase for the system, and these were translated into technical requirements, and um, we are part of the tender process, and these resulted in an architecture um, where we have two separated storage clusters. Uh, in a way, you could think of these as two separate disks, but of course, it's a much more complex setup. Um, one is, as um, it was mentioned, um, named tier storage, just because it has several tiers. And the other is a data lake, which has a more flat structure. And I will go into the details, uh, technical details uh, for each of these. But um, <clears throat> yeah, what I can mention, so here it's just a very very high level overview of um, the interfacing also um, from the systems and how it was uh, taught to, to function and also um, yeah uh, there is a it's it's visualized a connection between the two clusters obviously so the solution is uh, based on ibm elastic storage system and um, the system is designed for high availability it has no single point of failures, and it is also um, providing on the fly maintenance for increased uptime. And um, it has also a balanced failover high speed network for all of the system. So, a little bit about the hardware um, we have uh, multiple building blocks. Uh, building blocks are, as mentioned, based on the IBM ESS uh, technology. One is IBM ESS 3200, which includes NV NVMe drives. The other is ESS 5000 uh, technology using the new line uh, SAS drives. Um, the network is 100 gigabit Ethernet um, interconnect. It is based on IBM uh, switches. Um, and there is possibility for infinite band connection later if uh, that would be needed. Um, the new service platform, I will go into details a little bit later as well, but uh, it's also connected to the same uh, high speed network interface. And um, other than this, the technology is based on power line servers. It has dedicated uh, IO nodes, dedicated data movers, dedicated backup, backup servers. Protocol nodes for each of these um, protocols, which um, will be provided, um, separate encryption key service. So it's a, a neat and very um, well designed solution, uh, we think. So the tier storage, uh, so the tier storage contains building blocks based on the NVMe and also nearline SAS drives, and the data lake uh, has only nearline um, SAS drives using the ESS 5000 blocks. Uh, a little bit about the software. Uh, the software is uh, IBM Spectrum Scale, um, which is GPFS uh, version 5 uh, currently. Um, for those of you who are familiar with GPFS, um, well, I can say a couple of words. GPFS, it's a generic parallel file system. It's a profile system with a lot of history behind, uh, with a stable code, uh, but it's also very performant. It is used all over the world also for high performance computing as well, but not only. Um, and um, uh, one uh, particularity, for example, with the GPFS uh, file system is that when um, a generic 
another peripheral system will start to struggle at, for example, at 70 or 80 uh, percent of usage, GPFS will keep on with more or less the same performance as um, as it was with empty disks. Um, the apologies, the backup system uh, it is based on uh, IBM Spectrum Protect um, that was formerly called TSM. If someone is um, familiar with that, then there is a compression uh, software based on uh, IBM Guardian Key Lifecycle Manager. Um, there is also uh, data insight possibilities using IBM Spectrum Discover. And object storage is based on OpenStack Swift, which provides S3 APIs and uh, unified file and object storage for our system. And uh, the operating system, in the end, it's uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So a little bit about the capacity and performance. Um, as Francesco was mentioning, so um, we have approximately 22 petabytes or 20 petabyte um, storage on the tier storage um, part. Uh, here, I just um, I need to mention that um, we use exchangeably uh, these acronyms, either TS or NEED TS. So if you see this in the documentation or in the email communication, just to know that it's the same thing, uh, it's, uh, it's about the NEED tier storage cluster. Um, from these 22 petabytes, approximately 20 petabytes are allocated to the projects uh, currently. And um, the data lake uh, that has a total capacity around 11 petabytes or approximately 10 petabytes. And from this, currently 1.8 petabytes are allocated to the project, uh, which is, yeah, which is the data lake. I will go into more data, uh, details later. Uh, with um, regards to the performance of these systems. So um, the aggregated bandwidth on the network uh, for the tier storage is up to 400 gigabit per second. Um, and on the data, like it's 200 gigabit per second. And um, the measured IO throughput on the tier storage is 209 gigabyte per second and 66 gigabyte per second on the data link. Um, just for comparison, that C file system was um, benchmarked to 50, 51 gigabyte per second. So um, the near, new need is um, very capable in terms of performance as well, not only the inside of storage. Um, yes. Some of the common functionalities for um, for the two clusters, um, both are supporting multi-tenancy. Um, they are providing snapshots per file system or per project. And uh, it is based on um, GPFS, as mentioned. It provides GPFS and NFS4 uh, ACLs, supports extended attributes. It has health and performance reporting possibilities, and it has metadata management. Here we are talking about system metadata, so um, um, not discipline-specific uh, metadata management. A um, little bit more about the architecture. So in terms of functionalities, um, as mentioned, so um, there are some differences. Um, I saw that there have been some questions. What are the differences between the tier storage and data lake? Here we see also some differences. So um, obviously, I mean, the system is supporting PASIX, but um, in terms of protocols, uh, tier storage provides NFS and um, Samba might follow later on as well, but it, there is a possibility for that as well. Uh, while the data lake um, will provide in, in addition to the POSIX uh, S3 uh, capabilities as well. Um, in terms of APIs, um, I can mention the GPFS APIs. Uh, there are uh, low-level C calls, which one can use. There is documentation if someone is interested, which uh, we can provide a um, link to. Uh, it is important to note that GPFS APIs are not supported on Windows, on Windows systems, although this is not a problem internal on the um, 
infrastructure, our infrastructure, because everything is based on Linux. Um, there are possibilities for encrypted projects, file access logs, um, and there is also possibility for uh, collecting system metadata and uh, get some insight in what is happening on basic on these systems. Um, yes, I was mentioning uh, ACS and extended attributes. And in addition, uh, when the S3 um, is uh, put into production, then role-based access control through S3. In terms of file systems, uh, the tier storage has a project file system, has a home file system, and a scratch file system. Um, these are file systems which are accessible to the um, to the users, and um, the scratch file system. I need to mention just that uh, it is available on the uh, near login nodes, not um, not on the HPC systems. Um, and um, it also provides storage for the research data archive. Um, on the data lake, the file system available for the uh, researchers is called NEAT data lake, and um, yeah, it's mounted as such on the uh, NEAT login nodes. The data lake um, as a cluster, it's providing also backup for the tier storage, and it is um, acting as a secondary site for the NEAT uh, research data archive. When it comes to the quotas on the system, um, the default quotas set for uh, homes is 60 gigabyte um, and 300,000 files. And when it comes to the projects and data lake, by default, every project will get uh, 300,000 files at the initial allocation. And the quota is based on the allocation by the research allocation committee. Um, Regarding the scratch file system, there is no quota applied, but it has a 21 days retention time. The system is automatically cleaning up the data which is um, placed on the uh, uh, scratch file system. Here down below, you can see um, a screenshot of an example using the D usage command, which is available on the new login nodes. Uh, by running the usage without any options, uh, you will see your usage on the home uh, file system and um, and the limits. Yeah, also in terms of uh, file size, but also in terms of number of files. And uh, when it comes to a project, if you add uh, minus p flag to the usage, you can um, query your project and see the uh, allocation and the uh, usage for that particular project. Uh, a couple of words about the backup system. So as I was mentioning, it is using the IBM Threat and Protect system. It is an incremental backup. Um, but the backup system is sequential. And um, you need to note that when it comes to large amounts of uh, data, uh, the backup is slow it will take time to to back up the data but since it's interactive uh sorry uh, incremental um when the initial backup is taken then given that there are no big changes the backups are swift for the um, data of the um, changes um we are working on optimizing the setups to speed it up um so yeah this is uh, in in work and the policy for the backup is two versions of the same file one active version and one inactive this means that if you leave, delete a file uh, that will become inactive in the backup system and one version of the same file will be kept so if you keep changing the same file daily then um, you will have a one inactive version of the last changed or deleted file um, in that uh, in the backup system. The retention time for both, uh, I mean, for the expired data is uh, 90 days. Um, the backup system 
uh, obviously it's limited. Uh, we need to we need to make sure that we are backing up only necessary data. It is important also not only for the storage um, capacity, but also for uh, speeding up the the, um, the backup system um, to exclude everything unnecessary from the backups. And so far, we have translated the rules which are active on the old system, on the old NIFT. Um, some of you who have been asking for replication, uh, you may be familiar with the replication exclude um, control file, um, which is where you can basically specify files or folders to exclude from the replication on the old system. The same file is currently reused for excluding data from the backup. Um, the syntax will be changed, but uh, some native, uh, I mean, some examples are given and uh, will be provided also in the documentation. It's fairly easy to understand. Maybe one thing which might be a little bit confusing for you, it's the path to the project. On the storage system, the part of the project, it's not need projects, but it's project FS1. But um, I mean, you don't need to think about this, uh, except if you want to do some, some specific exclusion rules. And um, a couple of examples are given here. So if you want to exclude a full directory, it's just appending a star after the directory. Um, and then everything within that directory will be excluded. Another way to do the same, it's in the second line. Um, you need to have three dots, slash, and the star, and then um, again, the same directory will be excluded from, from being backed up. But keep in mind that the first one is using the syntax exclude.dir, and the second one is just exclude. The exclude is more generic, it's used for files. So for example, if you want to exclude a file, then uh, that would be, the syntax would be some, the following. So for example, if you want to exclude .sh files from being backed up, then the syntax would look like this. Um, in addition to this, we, we are excluding some, some um, files and folders by default from, from being backed up. And these are among others, uh, dot debug, for example, or temp, temporary TMP, what not combinations of all these. So we try to avoid from the beginning um, backing up uh, unnecessary data. Um, yes, so the next step, uh, a couple of words about allocations. Um, I saw that there has been a question about that. Um, so please note that the tier storage and the data lake technologies exist as of today, but sort of the data lake product is not yet defined. It is in the process of being defined. And currently the applications have been sent to uh, for storage on NIRT and then the uh, research Resource Allocation Committee Working Group and the Resource Allocation Committee have been assessing the um, applications and with a couple of exceptions, allocating the storages um, on the tier storage. Um, when technical description fitted well with Data Lake, we have been also in contact in some cases with the projects to try to verify if this is, uh, I mean, our understanding is correct. Uh, then the allocation was done on the data lake. Um, so as mentioned, so we are working on finalizing the data lake as a product and you may expect uh, changes in the application form in mass by the call 23.2 is published. Um, a couple of words about the file systems and access to it. Um, so when it comes to the new login nodes, uh, during the transition phase, uh, the fully qualified domain name is called login.need-lnd-sigma-2.0. This is to, um, to point to the infrastructure which is in left-hand lines and keep 
the current ones unaltered. But when the old need is decommissioned, then the FQDM will be changed to login need sigma terminal. Um, please keep in mind that the login need LND sigma terminal or later login need sigma terminal, it's a round robin domain name entry for four different login nodes. Um, these are login zero to login three. So if you are using the um, uh, the FQTN for logging, logging into the NILT, uh, you will get a random login node, which is preferred. But if you have something started on these login nodes and you want to get back to the same one, you can directly log into the node by using login zero, for example, login zero needs sigma to um, 42 CPU cores and 256 gigabytes of uh, gigabyte of RAM is allocated to a login node and resources are limited to 35 uh, gigabytes per user and 1000 processes. So the mount points on the need, as uh, I was pointing out uh, earlier on, are need home, need projects, and need data lake. Um, when it comes to the HPC login nodes, uh, after the transition to the new need is completed, then the project data lake uh, file systems will be mounted to need projects and need data lake, um, similarly as they are mounted to the need login nodes. So we will you will keep the same one points when the transition is finished. Um, yes, a um, few words about the near service platform. So the near service platform, it's, uh, it provides Kubernetes-based cloud services for persistent and on-demand services. And the near service platform, it's a computing platform, computing facility connected to the near storage. Um, it is connected to the uh, to the same 100 gigabit uh, Ethernet high speed interconnect, and it each each computing node for the need service platform has a 200 gigabit Ethernet bandwidth, and um, the service platform also provides NVIDIA V100 GPUs for AI and machine learning workloads. And as I was mentioned, so it has direct access to the home projects data lake and the scratch file systems on it. it in addition, it also has local NVMe disks um, for scratch, local scratch. So the, these systems are pretty capable and uh, you can use this for real cross processing, big data analysis, data visualization and, um, and uh, AI workflows. Uh, but it also runs persistent services such as portals and um, Obviously, if you are familiar with it, then the near toolkit available at apps uh, sigma to Anno. And a couple of services, persistent services, which are running on the near service platform are easy DMP, as mentioned, uh, near toolkit and the research data archive. So um, that was it from my side. Uh, I hope I managed to cover all the um, topics and questions uh, which popped up so far, but uh, I will be available for questions later on as well. And um, yes, uh, Siri, I think she is going to say more a little bit about the uh, sort of the need to get when um, her session comes. So with that, uh, thank you for listening. And, and then I give the word to, to my colleagues uh, to talk about a little bit about the data transfer. Yeah. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Sada, will, will you join me if there is any questions? Uh, yeah. Remind me to take care of that. Well. Uh, I saw that there is a question regarding home transfer that we will discuss uh, in, during this session. So uh, before we uh, start production, we started to pre prepare documentation and migration gate for the users. So, but uh, uh, just a warning that this is not finished yet. Uh, the uh, it's continuously continuously updating, and um, but uh, for the um, projects which uh, uh, which started production, uh, the important imp information is there regarding the nerd and the new nerd. So this is all the information uh, that you know about uh, the schedule of when your project is going to make uh, fully 
migrated um, that you might have already got an email from us. And most of the information Laurent was uh, talking earlier about architecture, uh, data like and your storage. So below there are some sections I would like to uh, present it today and how to access and how to log into the uh, new node. In this documentation, you can, uh, if you are not, don't have an account or project, uh, you, you go to this link and uh, uh, see how to apply for it. And we have a session in for file transfer where you can see how to transfer files between uh, your uh, local computer or between HPC and NED. Uh, we are not going to talk uh, a lot about it now, but the session after me will have a uh, focus on data transfer. So as Lauren uh, mentioned, uh, currently this address is login node-lmd.sigma2.0 uh, until we finish the uh, completely go on production, we will use this uh, following address. And when you log into um, new node, uh, I can show it a little bit here. Um, can you see my uh, terminal also, Sada? Yeah. That's great. So. Okay, I have to. Uh, uh, yes, uh, your um, username and password is as, as same as the old net. And here I have passwordless login. So I am um, logged in to new net, I think so. No, this is the old net, Dana. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I forgot to. Yeah, so um, so here you have the home directory. When you log logged in, you you go to the, your home directory, and uh, your home directory uh, when you first log in, it will be empty, uh, empty. And uh, we asked users to uh, migrate your home directory to the new node. So there is a link. Uh, of suggestion how to migrate uh, your home directory here. And we have this fact. If you go down, we have um, answered the question, how do I copy migrate my home folder from old net? And we recommend our sync to use. And also this is the recommendation, like uh, don't copy all the files, like all the Git files, all the Conda files are uh, to the new net. Uh, the necessary uh, scripts you want, and you can compress it. This migration user gate contain most uh, how to compress and how to find empty directory and folders and all these things. So you can have a look at and do it because we have sent this information before we started the migration. So, um, yeah. This is, uh, the answer to your question on uh, question number five as well. And there will be a uh, software access. We can also access software on command line as well as um, from module. And this documentation contains a lot of warnings because uh, we are not completely in production. We are testing a lot of things. So if there is something uh, not really uh, stable, you should contact us. Um, if, if I want to, Mm, no, the module, so um, CDO, so I can uh, check with module and you can find a uh, different version of uh, CDO here. And also there is, uh, if I'm not wrong, there is a uh, command line uh, access also for a uh, limited number of uh, modules. No. Probably not. Mm. No, so that's uh, that's not for CDU at least. Mm. Probably I should try. Mm. 
Python. Yes, there are uh, command line access for a uh, limited number of uh, software, but you usually you can access uh, with the software module scheme. Uh, how do you access uh, software uh, in on our clusters? That's uh, similar as it is. Uh, there is something we have updated about storage areas, quota, and backup here. As Lauren mentioned, there is a usage command. If I go to my uh, home directory and uh, type the command usage, you could find uh, my home directory. There is a limit of 600, uh, 6 gig and 30,000 file a number of files for my quota on my home directory. So this quota is also included the backup from uh, HPCs. Uh, so it's not yet enabled yet, but when it's enabled, you will have the your uh, HPC home folder backed up on it. Um, and as Lauren mentioned, there is a scratch directory with a 30 uh, terabyte. And this scratch directory is only available when the user is uh, has any Nerd project, and we enforce this automatic cleanup strategy for uh, scratch. That means after uh, twenty one days or seventy five percent of file system breaches, it make it uh, deleted. So be careful when you use the scratch uh, directory. And the project area, you also have a uh, quota for project area. So I have some project in my. Uh, so if I go for the usage minus P and my project, uh, you could see that uh, the project has uh, how much uh, usage we have for this project for uh, disk as well as a number of files. And this project uh, and resource projects means we are on tiered storage. The current project has allocation only on uh, tiered storage. If you have a project which has a, uh, allocation on data lake as well, uh, you will get uh, data lake instead of projects here. I think, uh, I have another one. Uh, is it the correct number, uh, Lauren? Oh. It is correct number, but you have a, a space between the um, dash and p. Ah, uh, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, here, this project has a location on only on data lake, so that's why the, the usage is showing uh, data lake here and the resource. So, if if your project has both data lake and uh, tier storage allocation, it will show the allocation on both. So something about snapshots um, and both home directories uh, and the project areas uh, on tiered storage and data lake are uh, have temporary backup in the form of snapshots. Uh, just to remind that it, this is this is a temporary, not a permanent back, backup. So if if you want um, higher data in um, integrity and all, then you have to use backup as services. So here we have daily snapshot for seven days and weekly snapshot for the last six weeks. Every, this will be stored. And after that, uh, it will not be stored beyond that limit. So where the snapshots are located? Uh, on Nerd uh, for home and projects, you can, find the path of snapshots. And if there is something happened within a day, usually you, you should be able to retain the data from the snapshots. Uh, you don't need uh, help from um, operators for uh, retaining your data uh, from the snapshots. So here is uh, details about to, to, uh, how to recover, uh, recover deleted data. So snapshots from HPC projects are not enabled. 
and this will be enabled uh, after the complete migration uh, of all the projects to the new net. So as uh, since as Lauren mentioned earlier, we have backup as a service or not. Um, So we are ex uh, this excluding a specific file, how to do that. All this mentioned in the documentation is similar as how you were doing on old nerd. Uh, if there is any kind of changes we are going to apply in the coming uh, months, this will be updated on the documentation. Uh, can you say something more about this, uh, Laurent? If, about the configuration and... Uh, um i mean so far we have not uh we have not decided if we are going to keep the same control file or just go for another one um i think we might just um, rely on the same control file to not uh, um, make things even more complicated mm -hmm. and uh, how do we uh, if if a project when applying for allocation how do they know that uh, like they can take this uh Backup as a service is there when the, pro um, when the projects apply for um, for storage, they in the application form they need to fill in whether they need uh, they want to have backup or not. And we were also asking for an estimate of how much that uh, backup they think they would need for their storage system uh, for their um, project. Mm -hmm. um, that is also that is only for us to try to estimate basically the space required on the backup uh, storage um keep in please keep in mind that um there are some multi-period allocations which were sent um, in earlier um periods uh, which uh where the application form was asking whether they the project wants to have replication or not if um a project had such a multiple application asking for application we take it as asking for backup for the moment because it, at the end of the day it's it's preserving the secondary copy on a separate system so the uh, so the replication is not there since it was uh, for the primary storage and storage and secondary storage on the old net this is backup as a service now Yes. Okay. Yeah, and we have already configured the backup on the new net, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, not fully activated yet for all the project, or we are doing it one by one. Uh, yes, I can mention that um, the backup is being configured and activated in box of projects as they are being transferred to the new new unit into production. Mm -hmm. And um, this is also important. Um, this is also why I was mentioning that the initial backup is taking a little bit of time because it's a sequential process. And if you have a project with, for example, 300 um, million files, it will take some time until it backs up. So it will not be able to finish in, in a day or two, but maybe it will take a, a week to finish the initial backup. But then when this is done, the incremental backup will be uh, more swift because we don't expect to have changes of in order of 100 millions of files in the project. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Sada, is there something you want to add here? Uh, no, I mean, there is a question about uh, if snapshot is counted towards your quota. Um, I think this is a, uh, Counted, right, Laurent? I think no. No, no. Or Tilly, can you answer this? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We yeah, can no. Hear. I say no, 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 no. It's okay. not. It's yeah. not counted in your quota. So. Yeah. Thanks, Tilly. Is there any other question? I could uh, go back. Uh, yeah. No. Please ask your questions here. And yeah, there. Are, much more on this, a little more on mount points. Um, we have not yet uh, mounted on HPC, but this documentation will be updated further and you can see the warning and not here. Uh, the 
path uh, for tier storage, storage is nerd project and your project number. You can, uh, you can access your data from NED, uh, NED data from your, from your HPC and vice versa uh, and store it. But uh, maybe can I ask a question regarding the data like here? Are we going to have a month point uh, for data lake as well? You mean on HPCs? Yes. Uh, yes, we need to because uh, there are a couple of projects which will have allocations on only on data lake, but in also some projects might have allocation on both. We already have a project which has allocation on both tier storage and uh, data lake. So they will probably need to access both um, soldiers from the HPCs. Okay, thanks. Uh, I had this uh, doubt uh, while preparing the documentation. Mm. Yeah, that's all we have prepared so far uh, regarding the documentation, but I would suggest uh, you um, go to this uh, NERD. Uh, uh, like this is the old NERD. Um, is still, documentation is still there because we wanted to uh, uh, remove it after we migrated all the projects and after decommissioned the old NERD. So the old NERD uh, documentation will be still available. Mm, do you have something regarding documentation or something you would like to know uh, that we need to update on the documentation? Let us know. And we are here to do that. And I think I am also ahead of time. Um, if there is no more question, I will stop here and maybe uh, we will continue with the data transfer. Yeah, I think just one notice, Sadana, which we should mention that um, when the documentation is clean up from the old near uh, then the new near tier as, as well as the full qualified domain name will be just need not need at LMD. Yeah, it, of course, thanks. Yes, because we needed to have this overview of uh, what we are updating. So uh, not to make more com confusion, this is an aid at LMD that will be removed after everything is cleaned up. Thanks to mention, uh, thanks for mentioning that. Around. And Sadra, Thiri, uh, Andreas, are you ready to go ahead with the data transfer now? I am. Yep. Yeah, and the screen is yours. Thank you. Sada, I will. Yeah, I will share. I will share it. Yeah. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, so our documentation used to say uh, that we that we suggest using SCP to transfer things. Um, this is the link for this. It contains a few examples. Um, this is basically what I will go through here with some more examples. So we, after realizing that SCP doesn't really scale quite well, we've been using more and more rsync, at least internally, and we think it could be a tool for people to use instead. Um, it has a very large amount of options to do what you might want to do, but most of them are not really something you need to know about. But um, I've, at least in the next slide, put up some um, flags that you might want to use just in the way that you probably would write SAP-R for recursive uh, moving of files. It would be something as a combination of these instead. The most common ones that you probably always want to use is the dash, dash archive or just dash A. It's actually a bunch of other um, flags, but it's what you want to use. It's recursively transferred things and it makes sure that it keeps metadata, like who owns it, um, the group ownership, um, the axis flags, etc. So those just keeping that will make it make a copy from your location to another location, and it would mostly look the same. It doesn't include hard links, which you might want. Um, 
which is a capital H, but um, for now, we'll just not mention that. Since you're doing this in a terminal, you probably want to see some indication of what it's doing. Dash V or dash dash verbose will print things as it's doing things. There's a flag called dash dash update or dash u that will look at timestamps of your file and compare them. So if the destination is newer than what you have, it will not transfer it to make sure that you don't overwrite something. Uh, this is, of course, then important that you actually have timestamps. So um, for some reason, that wasn't lost in some other process. It allows the option of using setlib to compress in flight with the with dash dash compress with dash set. And it does allow for some sort of indication of how it's doing, as in how fast it's doing, how much it's going to do, how many files left with this dash dash info equals progress two, or there's another one just dash capital P, which is a more simple version. Also, if you are not sure what it will do, you can also add dash dash dry run to just make it print what it would do, but it will not actually do it. The examples I put here is very simple. Dash AVZ would then archive, it would print what it's doing and it would use um, compression while it's doing this. And it's always from a from to a, a destination. But it doesn't take from a host to another, from a remote host to another remote host. So it's either from your local. Okay, it also does from your local to your local. That works. But as the example, first example here, what I call just a local file.tar is remote, copied then to a remote host and the path to where it is. It, here I used an absolute path. But also your home area would just be um, a colon and nothing more. The second example is the same thing, but you want to copy for something some remote. You want to sure that you don't overwrite anything. So you add the dash u or just u inside the, the flags. And it will also copy from that remote to. Let's say I have a directory called copy of remote in my working area. Next. Um, we had a question recently, how do we deal with large data transfers when sitting and watching a, a, a rsync going for days would be tiresome or weeks even. And it depends. Uh, so I have some strategies for how I would do something like that. And it's all of them are basically trying to take a problem and divide it into smaller parts in a way that it's easier to run them in parallel. For, here, for this first one, I have something I just called, if you have a bunch of files and they are neatly um, organized in your working directory. You can use rsync in parallel with either xargs for those who are used to that or in parallel. Both sort of spawns processes um, as instructed. The example I'm using here is first using types to give a list into xargs. So ls-1 will just print one um, item per line. So you basically present a stream of files that are um, new line separated to XORGs, which then say, I want to have 10 processes using dash capital P. And the way those um, items are then used in the processes it will spawn, I use um, this percentage sign to um, <coughs> use sort of as, an, um, as what will be replaced in the uh, process I'm using. rsync dash a set, because I don't really want to 
we'll look at the terminal just printing as much as it can, as fast as it can. So just don't really print anything. Then it still needs to know where does it find these files. So I said have to files, and I use then have to files with the um, percentage sign to say this is the for argument that you are using for each process. And then um, for the remote username at host and the path to the sniff would put them. Um, this would work if your files are sort of neatly um, sized and so on. But let's say you have some files that are just larger. Um, and then again, if you, how we just make this, um, make your list that you feed to our text args can be as simple as just telling us uh, ls to sort using dash capital S on size. And then again, I want to have it one per line. And that could work. If you have other ways that you think uh, is a better way to pipe these kind of things into XORGs, then use that. But this is some basic example. Note that um, LS does not actually evaluate the size of a directory, um, it prints what the directory itself use for space and that depends also on the subdirectories but not the file contents so if you would have a really large um, directory it could still only be a few kilobytes and it would not then sort well next uh one back yeah um so you had um instead a really large file um and here i pretend I have a huge archive. You can still create a lot of small files by using a, another command tool called split. And here I'm using dash B to say I want in one gigabyte um, parts. So split dash B, one G archive dash tar. And then the last argument is sort of what it will use to um, use for naming the, the parts that it's uh, basically writes out as a process. After doing this, you will have a probably a large amount of um, evenly sized um, archive.tar.part and it uses letters that, um, that increment so it will still sort in the same direction. And then use XR XRs like previously to transfer these. So now I'm instead of transferring one that one archive with one R sync, I'm using 10 in parallel. And of course, then you need to assemble them back into the archive on the destination. And I just mentioned here, avoid overwriting your source file in case you were to write this where you're working and to avoid certainly overwriting your source in case you would need it again. Next. Um, what I think most people will have instead are some sort of directory with other directories. There will be files here and there. They are not necessarily um, easily sorted by size in a way that makes it simple to figure out which one you want to transfer the first. And for those, you need to actually try to figure out which parts are the big parts and do those first um, if you want to get something going while you then later just finish up your transfer. There's a tool called DU, Disk Usage. It uh, is sadly a bit slow considering the, the sizes of the, the files and directories we are used to deal with. I use dash MX to make it print just in megabytes because it's a regular flag that it supports. X has, it should not move outside the file system in case you were to have mounted a file system somewhere deep down in your directory. It will keep trying to evaluate those as well. And that 
stupid. Max step to make sure just to print up what you have here. So, or you could, of course, make further depths, but it's not something you need. And then sort, type it to sort, dash n to numeric sort, so that your largest files are at the, the lowest of the thing you will print out. Have that to tail and tell it to only print the last three lines, dash n3. Here I see that in my fake example that uh, I have a large file, but it's not really that large since it's two gigabytes. Well, I have a directory that's considerably larger. And I would do this process again inside that candidate there and see if I can find some other um, candidate that needs to be handled. And then again, um, transfer that. Uh, rsync will ensure that as long as you keep the paths that you pass to it, it will create those paths. So if you pass path to source directory, as I've had here, it will also create that if it's supposed to move some sort of um, subdirectory it finds. Um, and I probably should make sure that say that you need to be a bit certain that the directories are copied as you want them so that both sides look the same. But when you have filled in your destination somewhat with, let's say, 90, 95% of what you need to transfer, simply passing rsync with the usual flags and from your source to destination as you would. It will find the files that is already there and skip those, and then only fill in the left. And next. Oh, yeah, this is uh, another thought of the slide. Um, I think this sort of is a um, summary of the things I've said so far. It should be mentioned that it says also resumes interim transfers. When rsync is moving something, it will create a temporary file that writes things. And if you were to interrupt it and resume your transfer, it will use this temporary file to see how far it's gotten and continue from that point. This itself makes it quite better than SCP to move since SCP doesn't really know about these things. Um, next. Um, yes, this I think was a subtle slide if you want to say something. Yeah, this is <clears throat> from Thierry, I think. Okay. Yes, uh, I can just quickly comment. It's, uh, I think it's somewhere in our documentation. It's a, it's a special case if you have a lot of small files. Uh, in that case, RSIC is not very efficient because uh, for each small file, it will create an overhead to, to transfer the file. So it's better uh, to um, put all the small file in a tar file and then transfer only uh, one file, which is a tar file. And on the other side, of course, you will untar it. And as an example, a benchmark example, I created a folder with thousand small files, one megabyte files. And I tried to transfer that with a simple rsync command, and it took 1.5 minutes to do. And if instead I uh, create a tar file from that, it takes about five seconds. Then the tar file uh, will take also five seconds, depending, of course, of your uh, network speed. And five seconds to run down the other side. So you see, in my example, uh, you have 15 seconds instead of uh, uh, 90 seconds. So it's a speed up of uh, a factor of six. 
and this scale linearly approximately. So if you have a 1 million file, uh, of course, for 1,000, it's not really big different, but if you have uh, millions of files, then it's, you, you should consider doing uh, something like that to speed up your transfer. Yeah, transferring uh, between uh, Batsy from Saga and Near. So we don't have a new Near mounted yet on the uh, all the clusters. So uh, it will be mounted, and uh, the mount point will be a Near project, and uh, Near the data lake. Um, once this is mounted, you can use uh, copy move. Uh, Commands to move the files in between, and you can also use uh, rsync, as Andreas mentioned, that you can do it on the local machine. You can use it in the same way. Mm. And there are some other tools that we didn't want to go deep into. For example, the Win SCP. If you use Windows machine, um, you can check that. And we also have uh, links for uh, SFTP um, that will also uh, do the transfer. Um, I think this is uh, about it, and I also want to show you the, the the page. I'm not sure if you can see it properly now. Um, I can. Yeah, this is the link to our documentation, and um, here we have uh, some examples about rsync and SCP, and how to transfer the file, how to transfer the directory. Um, also, the explanation of um, different parameters and how you can use it. Uh, and also compressing a file, compressing a folder. Um, and um, there is also some benchmarking um, doing STP and rsync. And there's a, we have, according to our experience uh, so far, the rsync is uh, doing always better, but uh, there are some occasion that the uh, STP is uh, giving better result. So this is the page you probably should go through before you do any transfer so that uh, you become uh, familiar with uh, what you are going to do and how you compress your file. Or if you have to compress the file, if you have to put all the small files into one folder, or if you have to, uh, like Andreas showed, list your you know the big folder and find out the big files and load them first and uh, so on. Um, I don't have anything else to present. If there is any question, we can... Yeah. May I ask it. a question regarding... Uh, yeah. answer. But it's all of, uh, to all of you. Uh, when you said, when uh, do you suggest to use a TMOX or screen while transferring files? Yeah. Um, uh, or your question is uh, if we recommend it? Pardon? Or uh, what was the question? The question is if you recommend TMUX or screen. Yeah, yeah. And when? When should we, when when should as a user I should use that? Um, I think if you, uh, for example, I have some cases that um, I transfer some stuff from uh, the local server. I have access to the local server and I'm moving some stuff to some uh, need. For example, I normally do it because if I know it, it will take a long time. I tended to run it on uh, in screen or in Tmux. It depends on which one you prefer. And in that way, uh, you can just log out uh, after the work, and then you can check it later to see what is the progress uh, from the Tmux or um, screen. Um, this is the one way I'm going to use it. I'm not sure if there's any other comments or suggestion with regard to the Tmux and the screen. Uh, do you have something about the troubleshooting with the screen or Tmux, uh, Kitty? If uh, if the uh, file transfer during uh, which will last for uh, like more than a day, uh, what would we suggest? I remember that uh, for Nerd, we suggest to pull it from Nerd uh, rather than from the local machine. Is it same? Is it going to be the same for new Nerd as well? Is there any DNS uh, housekeeping? One, 
One uh, problem we had on the whole NIR is that uh, we got interruption every 12 hours approximately of the network. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you run your uh, air sync at the command line, it will stop. So that's why uh, it was suggested to run it in a screen session or Tmux. Uh, on the new system, we shouldn't have that, uh, that problem, which was specific to uh, kind of uh, process run regularly by uh, Uninet on the network, which was producing this kind of uh, side effects. So it, sh it shouldn't happen on the new NIRB. But anyway, it's a good, uh, as uh, Sarda said, it's, it's a good uh, way to do uh, long transfer uh, in a screen or team accession, yes. Anyway. Thanks, Jenny. And there is a question on the hedge talk. Uh, how does our clone compare to using our sync? Um, can anyone of you answer that? Or? Um, I have not used our clone, but um, I'm not sure if Andreas, do you have any experience? As I understand, our clone is multi threaded. So I'm not um, familiar with it either, but I think it probably behaves a bit like our sync. Yeah. I think um, I think you choose you, you choose a protocol with your clone, isn't it? So I uh, I suspect it in the background it, it uses the, uh, the same tools. Uh, but uh, yeah. yeah. So we don't yes. have a we, I mean we don't have an experience and we can take a look at it and if it's and test it if it's uh, any better we will added to the documentation. I thought it was mostly the cloud uh, equivalent, uh, but I, I don't know much yeah. about no. A quick look at the, the site calls it the Swiss Army knife of cloud storage, and it will probably do these kinds of things, but it also says, among other things, it supports S3. But um. Yes, it exists. We don't recommend it as a catch-all tool today. We are quite ahead of the time. So I was thinking if we can um, have, uh, if there is any question, uh, if participants want to voice out, you can do it and uh, we will uh, Reschedule all the uh, afternoon schedule. Like uh, we will come back twelve thirty instead of uh, one o'clock, so that we can finish it earlier. Is there any other questions or please ask on the uh, collaborative document? Yeah, on uh, there is uh, was regarding to the question about uh, copying the home directories. Um, I think it's good chance to clean up the home directory when you try to move it. So you don't have to move everything, just to take what you need. And uh, at the same time, you can um, clean up a bit. I think it's a good idea to create it again on the, yeah. on, on the new system, because it has a lot of small files, it's not... Uh, uh, since we are uh, discussing Conda, um, maybe something to take uh, about this uh, disk usage issue. Yeah. Like, uh, Kitty, would you like to talk about something? Like when uh, disk usage um, error is happening, if like thousands of Conda files within a single Conda environment, what do you suggest? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's written in our documentation. Is uh, it's preferable to to create your Conda environment in your project because uh, you will always end up with a uh, exceeded quota in your home directory at the end. So I think there's a description how to do that in the documentation, and uh, you should probably do that. Yeah. We have much more uh, resources in project. To allocate more uh, more metadata resources for your uh, files, and I would like to add also that 
uh, don't uh, create a, condo, a same condo environment on the project itself, but to share it with every members. So yeah, that's, that's, important. Uh, that's important. That's important. <laughs> Uh, you can create a shared Conda folder or somewhere and you can create all the environment you want to. But uh, and on the new NERD, we have a lot of uh, softwares available now, rather more than uh, the old NERD. Right, Tiri? That would be... Less. Yes, we provide now modules and that's uh, one in the, in the login, Banir. It's, uh, it's not yet stable, so you can start using it. And if you uh, come to uh, some issue, please uh, contact our uh, support and let us know. Yeah. And just to to let you know, also they may uh, you you may find uh, the module uh, software which is not really uh, uh, good to be used on the near there. So more HPC uh, type of software. So. Before trying to use it on here, you should consider uh, if it's a good idea. Eventually, you can contact us and ask if, if we think it's a good idea. But uh, we have a, rim, a limited amount, uh, resource amount on the login nodes. So you have to consider that there are many people at the same time, and it's, uh, it's important not to overload our systems. And uh, what is the procedure if someone uh, exceeds the quota, home quota? What uh, they are supposed to do? They contact us or they're supposed to uh, delete the unnecessary files like Honda or Git uh, files? I, I think according to our experience, uh, when the home on your home quota is exceeded, normally it's uh, some temporary case um of course we recommend to clean up the home you know don't create so many files there just some permanent files but uh, some according to experience, our experience at some cases we can temporarily extend it and then but we have to set it back after you've done with this um, temporary you know project or whatever you are working on i mean we don't have a or we don't extend it the problem we have so far, especially the number number of files um, on the home area, because of Conda and because of some different stuff. So, uh, as as I said, clean up, you know, make it clean, and then if you really have a need, you have to take contact with us, and then we will take the case, uh, each individual case uh, by case. Mm -hmm. And HPC home folders also, like if they have uh, one HPC home folder and it's also exceeds, that also counted in the 6 GB and 30,000 file numbers, right? Yes. yes. So it's very important you uh, do housekeeping of your phone, home folder, both on HPCs and on that. Um, and also when you transfer your data to the new year, if you have any challenge, if you have uh, any problem to transfer your files, so you can always open a case and we can uh, take a look at it and probably provide the best uh, solution that we can to help you out. On that note, uh, it's not like everyone has access to the new net yet. We are doing it in a coordinated manner. Uh, we have published the schedule uh, and any kind of status will be updated there that was communicated uh, with uh, project leaders and also you can find that uh, schedule list on the NERD documentation as well, so, uh, link to the schedule. Um, th there is another question regarding to the, I mean, num number eight, when will the HTTP access to project area WW folder be restored? This is about the service platform, I think. Is it the web service, uh, Tiri? Some projects uh, are exposing uh, folders to outside with uh, the service platform indeed, and it it will happen at the same time as the project is migrated. So currently, the so real project is still on the old uh, NIRD. The web service is there, and uh, once it is uh, migrated, the data and everything to the new NIRD, we will uh, 
for you migrate the web service to the new uh, service platform and uh, restart it there. So for you, there's nothing to do. If it's a question, uh, if it's what you're asking about. And uh, number nine, maybe Laurent can answer it. HPC user, should I apply HPC storage or near storage? Um, in general, so when you are applying for HPC computation hours, you get allocated computation hours and um, a default quota on the HPC storage. And um, that should be kept at minimum because the HPC storage, it's, I mean, the more data is put on the HPC storage, the slower the HPC storage is going to become. So in general, it is better if you have needs for large amounts of storage, for example, I don't know, 15, 20 terabytes, uh, that should be already kept on the on need. It is also important to be mentioned that on the HPC storage, so uh, that storage is basically designed with high performance in mind, but no um, data redundancy. So you don't have you don't have that um, security in uh, in back as 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 for the need. So in, for the need, you have uh, as I, I was I mentioning. So you have. Um, no single point of failures. You have snapshots on the system. You could potentially also have backups if needed. Um, yeah, I think the, the system is also much more secure to, to keep these kind of data. I'm not sure if this is answering the question, but uh, we can elaborate more if, if uh, it is. It uh, really depends on the user, right? Yeah. Uh, Thierry, this might be a question to you. Uh, the availability of IPCC nodes, do we have an update now? I think we are waiting for the main project uh, attached to this service, which is uh, NS2345K. So as soon as this one is ready, we can uh, reopen access to, to that uh, node, yes. Yeah, thanks, Adi. I see that uh, we are 45 minutes ahead of time, but I think we, it's the, we can have a lunch break now and come back at 12.30 and then go ahead. Or do you ha guys have another plan? If there's any question. I'm seeing for the question. Okay, then we don't have anything. Okay, so then we will uh, meet at 12.30 and we'll have net toolkit and then research, uh, Adi will talk about research data archive and uh, Andreas about object storage. We have three sessions and they open Q and A after this session. So we will, I hope we will finish it. So we come with more questions. Uh, like we are more people here, so we will try to answer that. And thank you, uh, Lauren, Thierry, Andreas, uh, Sadra, and everyone listened here. And I know that uh, the work you have been doing the last few days was very hectic and. We had to run this training since it was planned for months before. Thank you for all the hard work you are doing. And uh, we will see you in the afternoon. And thanks to all the participants uh, for their time. And uh, I hope you are glad to have this training. And if you have more questions, uh, please uh, go ahead. We will answer it in the afternoon session. Thank you. We'll have a break until 12.30 and have your lunch. I think we can start now. Yeah. Okay with you. So welcome back. And Siri will talk about the net toolkit uh, next half an hour, I guess. Siri, please yes. go ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, so I will talk about uh, the net toolkit. And um, so. yeah, 
So uh, node toolkit is uh, a type of what we call on-demand computing. And we have several uh, different types of services you can uh, start up. Um, it's uh, uh, some uh, are for data sharing, some are for specific software. Uh, we have a desktop VNC if you have some software that needs, uh, um, yeah, some type of visualization. Otherwise, uh, the most uh, popular ones are the Jupyter and the Jupyter Hub. Um, so how is the Nailed toolkit connected to Nailed? And like we have talked about a lot earlier today, the Nailed storage uh, down here, it's based on uh, GPFS and uh, attached to the uh, Nailed storage, we have the Nailed service platform. And on the Nailed service platform, we are running Kubernetes which is an orchestration for containers. And uh, in these containers, you can, we can set up some persistent storages and services. I mean, uh, some persistent services that are like uh, the archive, the NET archive is one example for this. And then we have NET toolkit and there you can set up uh, services that you can uh, uh, turn on and off. Um, yes, so with Kubernetes, there is a concept called a pod. And um, that's a way of uh, having a containerized application. And uh, with that containerized application, you can access, for instance, storage volumes, uh, or other kinds uh, of uh, components. And it is also very good for uh, setting up, uh, yeah, managing these types of services, scaling them up and down. And um, yeah, so this is what the concept called platform as a service. Um, So um, on the service platform, we can mount uh, the nailed storage, so large fast disks. Um, and then we can uh, yeah, ensure that we have high portability of tools and reproducibility of results uh, using containers. So these containers are uh, started from uh, Docker images, and these are and static. Um, so you can have them on different types of uh, and platforms that, that runs containers. And uh, yes, so what we want to uh, have on the nodes of platform is pre and post processing analysis, and then data uh, intensive uh, processing and AI and uh, machine learning uh, type of workloads, and we also have access to GPUs um, for for this purpose. Yes, so then I would like to just uh, demo how the Nail Toolkit is working. So I will share my screen again. Yes. So here we are. Uh, the Nail Toolkit is located at apps.sigma2.no. And um, so you can see that I have logged in. Um, for a new user, if you have Nailed Storage, but you have not used Nailed uh, Toolkit yet, uh, we have some documentation about how to get access to the service. And um, you will find it here um, under Nailed Toolkit and get ready to deploy a service. So we ask you to then contact Sigma2 uh, and bring some information that is needed in order to set up this. And 
uh, at FAIDA in SIN, we create groups or the, um, you can also create the group that, and in this group, you invite the people you want to have access to the services that you set up. And uh, it looks uh, like this when you log in to FAIDA uh, in SIN. Uh, there is a create group uh, button. So here, in uh, we have an example where there are two groups and uh, one of these groups I'm going to use in the, the rest of this uh, demo. Um, so the groups have, have a identi uh, identity and it's easy to add members. And uh, one reason that you can see that you can have many groups is that if you want to have one group that can start services and another group that can use the services that you start, but the people in the second group cannot, uh, you maybe don't want them to start services, just use the ones that are already started. You can uh, sort, uh, send, uh, yeah, uh, send the invites in different groups. Um, yeah. And here is, uh, if you click on the manage group, then you can find this uh, field and you can send uh, invite emails to people you want to invite. Okay, so let's get back to uh, the toolkit. So we would like to install a uh, Jupyter Hub. And um, here uh, we have the new front end. It's basically, uh, very similar to the one we had before. It's, uh, um, so yeah, uh, you give uh, what you want uh, the hub to be called. You choose a project space. Uh, you will get access to project spaces after you have been. Uh, uh, well, you have when, after you have applied for one. I'm using the Scratch, and then you can add which groups you want to have access to. Yes, so I'm a member of a lot of groups. And the one I want to use is this one. And so then that says how many people can access this the hub that you do make. It is actually possible for me to uh, make it so that the entire University of Bergen, because I'm a member of the University of Bergen group, uh, but I'm not gonna do that right now. Um, so then we have a list uh, of storage uh, spaces on NILD you can select so that your application will have the access to it. Usually there is uh, one uh, here when, uh, which is made when the project is created. And then there is some additional uh, configuration that is usually, uh, uh, you should usually check if there is something here you want to change. And one of the things I want to change in this uh, case is that I want to have some shared uh, storage between all the users of the hub. And inside my project space, if I have a data folder, and then it will start at, or give read-only access to this folder for all of the, the, the users that have their own Jupyter Lab instance from the hub. So I start installing it. And um, it will just uh, then contact uh, the Kubernetes cluster and start installing the relevant components. And it will take a, yeah, a little bit of time, but not so much that we need to do something else in the meantime, I think. But we can, uh, oh yeah, now it uh, is going into the initializing stage. And uh, then it automatically takes you to the application tab. And uh, here you see that this one is in status 
uh, initializing and now it's running. So then I can go and see what, uh, what I got from this. And uh, one of the things we have reconfigured recently is how you do the authentication. So now it's uh, not a, uh, anymore needed that some university uh, paid a, um, policies uh, made it so that some users needed to have the guest beta account. This is now solved. So every uh, institution or at least all the universities, they will now be able to use you know, toolkit without any issues. So I consent to this and we'll start a Jupyter uh, notebook from the hub in my, for my user. Yes. So here I am. I have some shared um, some shared data that was available from the data folder that I uh, touched. And then I have uh, already put in an example that I wanted to just uh, use, just to see that you have uh, if you have a Jupyter Notebook file on NILD, it will be uh, accessible to you in the NILD toolkit. And I can run it just to show what it looks like. So you see this one is just uh, making some movie of a random walk. Um, yes. So if you want to look at uh, the other uses of the hub, there is a hub control panel. And uh, from here, every user can see this part, which is stop and start my own server. Since I created a hub, I'm also the admin, which means I can see if there are other users setting up notebooks from the same hub. So I can then uh, stop and start everybody's service. So when I want to make a change, and uh, let's say I wanted to use a different uh, Docker image to get some different um, uh, software accessible in my service, um, it's usually smart to stop every service that is running. Um, so I'm stopping this one. Yes, so now and uh, the notebook I had running, it's, uh, it's, it's stopped. You see, it's, it's not uh, there. And then I can go back into the new toolkit and either reconfigure or delete. I'm going to use delete this time. So now the hub is going to disappear. I will go into the application list to show that in the application list, I can see the applications that I own. And right now I don't own any and because I just deleted the one I made. I can also see that in my uh, nailed project, I can see that there are some other people who are running services, uh, but I am not running any at the moment. Um, so I will go again and just make sure that I show you where you can change the Docker image and it's here. So this is the Docker image that we used to start the hub. So this one has all the software and uh, it is located in a repository, which is public. Everyone can go and see which, uh, yeah, see uh, if there are any other that you would like to use instead. And 
so it's it's here in Quay. We have some we have a organization, and when we build uh, um, the parameters, we push them here, and we build them from an open repository. Again, then this one is in uh, GitHub, and you can see this is uh, where you would find which Docker files we are creating these Docker images from. And I will use the rest of my time going through a little bit of how you create your own image. And then I will go back to my slides for that. Am I sharing the slides correctly now? Yes. Yep. Okay. So the GitHub repo that I showed you, uh, our Docker images there, uh, they are extensions of the official uh, Jupyter and Jupyter Hub official images. And the official images you find uh, under Jupyter Docker stacks. So these are the ones we build on. Um, one way of making a custom Docker image is to take one of the ones that we already have and take a very simple, this is a very simple Docker file. Uh, you set a from statement, you say, oops, to say that you would want to uh, start from this image. And then you can put a couple of, uh, install commands and then run uh, docker build on this one and push it somewhere and then you have uh, uh, an updated image with some extra software some of the images that we use are quite large so it could be problematic to do this part because uh, the laptop might run out of memory uh, which mine does so I have problems with some of the images that we use here to use that on the local machine instead of uh, where we build it usually. So if you want to start with something more simple, um, then uh, I have some recipe here for making a custom image with less dependencies. And to do that, it's... Uh, one thing you could do is to just uh, make a fork of this uh, repository that we have uh, that I showed you. Uh, clone the, the repository to your computer and then edit the Docker file. Uh, and then often it's best to use uh, the base notebook. And this is from the Docker stacks again, starting from this one which is one of the simplest ones they have there. And the reason that we would or, uh, recommend that you start from uh, our uh, repository instead of directly from the Docker stack is because we do some uh, integrations that are specific to how we set up. Uh, uh, yeah, in the nail toolkit, it's expecting some specific steps. Um, but you can remove uh, quite a lot of the software that you don't think that you will need. But uh, yeah. So next. Yes, so how to build a uh, Docker file. Uh, you need to have Docker installed and you go into the path and then the command is, uh, yeah. You use a uh, build command and you decide what the tag should be, what it should be named. Right. Yeah. So in order to push it somewhere that it is, um, the, you built an image, now you want it to be accessible on the web. And the easiest one to use is then Docker Hub. And uh, 
when you have logged in, you can tag it and push it to your uh, area in Docker Hub and it will be available to you there. And yes. So when you have made it uh, a public image, uh, you can use it on Nail Toolkit. And uh, then you can then restart a hub. And uh, like I pointed to the user image under the configuration tab. And uh, you use the tag that you made when you uh, pushed your image and it will find it. So when I showed the one from Quay, it needed to have Quay IO as the in the beginning, but if it's on Docker Hub, basically it just needs uh, your uh, where it is and what's the name, that's it. Yes, and I think I'm a little bit ahead of schedule. So I just put up this, uh, uh, how to contact in order to get it uh, configured. And uh, so if you have a nail project and you would like to try a nail toolkit, uh, yeah, that's the, the way to go. Yes, so I think that's uh, what I wanted to show today. Yeah, thank you, Jenny. Uh, can we take a couple of questions? I see some questions here. Yes. Uh, user was asking, can you connect multiple projects to a single application? So if you have, um, you need to have all the project leaders agree to it, uh, but then it is possible. We have some project which have an application space in one project, but the storage space points to two projects. That's possible. As long as the project leader of both uh, projects agree. Um, there is thanks. There is other question regarding Minayo. What are the access key and secret secret key in the prompted browser? Oh yeah. So that's um and when you do the configuration, you should try to change these. Um, I can share again, I guess. Yeah. See. But it's basically a username and password that you need to, to have. And um, I should show you where to change it because setting it up with a default, uh, then it's uh, maybe a little bit too open. So in the general, you put the name and everything like in, in the Jupyter example. And here is where you set uh, the username and password on how to access it. So, so this uh, it's quite important to change the key to something else. I hope that answered the question. So um, there are com questions coming up. Uh, maybe we will spend some time on the questions. Maybe if you have four minutes anyway. Hmm. Uh, Dana, while we are waiting for um, other questions, um, I could just add uh, two things. So um, CD mentioned um, the authentication system. So for uh, quite some while we had um, some let's say annoyances with the authentication system because of the change policies um, from FIDA. Uh, but now as Siri was mentioning, so the new toolkit is authenticating all the um, services which are deployed within the toolkit. So um, it and now the authentication is much more streamlined and, and uh, easier as, uh, as long as your institution uh, has access to to FIDA and as long as your institution has approved once the new toolkit so you will get access to the to all the applications in uh, new toolkit 
the other thing which I just wanted to add, uh, it is um, important to keep in mind that the resources are shared with other projects. So as soon as you don't have need for, um, for example, for the resources, um, you finished your work in the uh, Jupyter Notebook, it's good to stop it to free up resources in the system. Thanks, Tavan. Uh, Siri, can I can you take a couple of more questions? I can read it. Uh, what are the new cluster server name in the cube config for net uh, new net? I didn't get the question actually, but um, this is for I I'm unsure, but if it is for uh, there are some projects who are using. Uh, kubectl directly instead of using you know, toolkit. So if that's the case, then just contact us and we will give you the, the new uh, authentication after the project has been moved. Um, we have some people who use kubectl to set up services on their own. This is usually people who have had advanced user support project with us so that we know uh, them and that they get access to their own namespace and they can set up things uh, directly and not through the nail toolkit. Yeah. Thanks, I hope this answered the question because I was not aware about this QBC thing. And there are one, two more questions actually. Uh, is there any way for users to select the resources they need rather than the predefined uh, base CPUs and memory, etc. When you configure, uh, install the application. Yes, so we have the machine types. I just used the smallest one when I was doing the uh, demo this time. Mm -hmm. So there is a list. You could have clicked on this list, and then there would be. Uh, but to have it per user, uh, that's uh, in the Jupyter Hub, that is not uh, implemented right now. So if you want, um, so right now all the users will get the same. Uh, you have a hub and then from the hub, each Jupyter uh, notebook would have the same amount of resources. If you want to have uh, some smaller and some bigger, you can have two hubs. That's how it is right now. You would have to have two hubs to have different resources between the users of the hub. Okay. So if uh, but the uh, the selection is limited to the machine type, right? There cannot be a customized uh, machine type. Is this it available? We have quite a long list of machine types, and we do take suggestions for new ones. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Uh, uh, more granular selection of resources is not available currently, but this is something which uh, we are investigating. Yeah, thank you. And there was one question before that. Uh, what uh, what happened when uh, services migrate and uh, migrating? If uh, there is a minio is running, what will happen to that? So during the week migration, uh, these services will be suspended. And then when the migration is uh, over and they will be set up again by us if they were running at the time. So the running services, they will be uh, uh, started at the same time as the uh, migration of the project is finished. So the user don't need to do anything. No. Uh, URL, URL will be same. Also, for the main, uh, what did you say? The URL, uh, which will they, remain the same. Yes. Remain the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. If uh, there is more question, we will take it uh, during the Q and A session. And uh, now we can move to the next session, which is research data archive. And for that, Adil is here. 
Adil, could you give us an introduction of yourself and uh, start the presentation? Oh, okay. Yes, my name is Adil Hassan, and I'm a bit cold here in Norway. It's um, freezing. Um, I spent a bit of time looking after data of the various countries here and there. <clears throat> And um, now I help to set up the um, data archive in Norway and uh, looking after data management plans as well. Thank you. You can share the screen, right? Uh, I could, yes. Let me see. Where's this share button? Share away. Let's see. Why is it not working? Nothing works. There we go. Can you see anything? Yes, I can. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so I'll uh, I'll give you a short run through of the research data archive. <coughs> By the way, um, in case some of you wondering, there's another RDA around, which uh, is uh, uh, the Research Data Alliance, which um, I must admit, I got confused when I heard RDA. <laughs> okay, so um, the first thing, um, where does the archive sit? So uh, if uh, most of you are probably familiar with this um, uh, data life cycle, uh, where uh, in essence you, um, you create uh, some data and then you uh, go through and uh, uh, process or analyze that data <clears throat> and you uh, generate some findings which you uh, happily publish in some uh, journal uh, and uh, Probably at the same time these days, they're sort of quite closely connected because usually journals want uh, a link to the, the data. Uh, and then you also um, archive your data in some uh, long-term storage um, resource. And then uh, it's possible that some other people will come along and reuse your data and go through the whole cycle again. Or um, perhaps if your data has been superseded by some newer data, you may uh, reach the end of life of that data and uh, <clears throat> and the data can then be uh, deleted. So that all looks uh, very nice and good. And uh, I think um, in ancient times, I think these guys have probably been doing work in my house as well, because it looks about the same state. Uh, but this um, uh, is um, a picture of Stonehenge. And um, I think uh, one of the things, of course, we can say is that this is uh, very persistent. All these, um, <clears throat> all these stones have been lasting for thousands of years. Unfortunately, we seem to have lost the manuals, so we don't really know what these stones were for um, and uh, what we could use them for. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, it's all well and good to um store the data our data in a long-term archive but if we don't have any metadata then it's difficult to um to try and reuse this uh this in these these uh, persistent data later <clears throat> so that's why um we probably want to update this little uh life cycle uh diagram that we have where uh, at each phase in the um in the um <clears throat> life cycle um we're creating uh, bits of information that perhaps could be useful uh, when we archive the data so uh the takeaway from this is to um try and think about uh, as as we're going through uh, the different phases uh, to try and think about what information could perhaps be useful uh, to potential users of this data or maybe even me uh uh, later, um, at a later point in time, um, to be able to successfully reuse uh, uh, reuse this data. So, I think that's a, a very a very important thing to to try and keep in mind as uh, as we're going through this this process. And this is uh, one of the things that helps to increase the. Um, uh, I'm sorry to use this swear word, but the fair this fair. Uh, increase the fairness of data if we collect information as we're going along on the provenance on how to use the data any features in the data then uh, it makes it more reusable later <clears throat> okay so uh, how do i move this thing out of the way i'm going to minimize this oh yeah 
Great. Now I can see my slide. Uh, okay, so more on metadata. Um, uh, yes, as we were just mentioning, that um, at each phase of your uh, the, the data lifecycle, there will be information uh, that it's more than likely you will need, or people, uh, your colleagues will need uh, at a, diff a later stage in the life cycle. And some of that information may be also useful to try and uh, archive as well. Um, next one. Um, so the research data archive itself, it's, it's fairly uh, simple, uh, not really so much to say about it. Uh, it's a sort of a glorified form there to uh, fill in the metadata and, uh, and then archiving the data is a sort of slightly uh, separate uh, separate process. Um, so the archive itself is located on the need storage. Uh, it's uh, we started and it still is a, a generic archive. So it's not restricted to um, any one domain. Although we have a lot of climate data uh, in there at the moment, um, and because it's not restricted to uh, any uh, one domain. It, the amount, uh, the richness of the metadata is not what uh, many people would expect in uh, in their specific domains, and that's uh, because we look at the lowest uh, at, at, at the standard. Sorry, at, at um, the set of metadata that is common across all all data sets. So we can handle uh, small and large data sets. Um, we require. Um, people to fill in, uh, to provide some metadata with their uh, data. And since our, um, our metadata follows the um, Dublin Core standard, there's only about, I think, 11 terms in the standard. So it's a very small amount of metadata that we uh, need to uh, be supplied with the, uh, with, with, with the data. Uh, and at the moment, the uh, archiving uh, of data is free. Uh, all the, the data that one chooses to archive should ideally be uh, of, um, in quotes, lasting value to the community, to your community. So when we uh, start to think about uh, archiving uh, uh, data, we should, it's, it's a good idea to try and um, uh, think of some things before we actually go through the process, uh, go, th go, go through and, uh, an archive. Um, so the first thing that we need to think about is, uh, is to try and collect um, all the uh, uh, information that could be useful to, um, uh, to our colleagues or, <clears throat> excuse me, or other uh, researchers of, the, uh, uh, of our data. And um, since our metadata is fairly, I guess it's not as rich as uh, uh, as as many other standards. Um, it might be worth putting that information into a readme file or or, or more than one uh, of these sort of readme types of readme files that um, people can use to uh, to understand how to use the the data and. Then the other thing that we need to think about is um, whether the, the, the data that we're uh, going to, or we plan to put into the archive is, uh, is something that we should uh, archive. And it's not, it's not some um, sort of temporary uh, data, which perhaps is not worth uh, archiving. Uh, and this is always a tricky thing to, um, to figure out. Uh, um, if data has resulted in publications, of course, it's highly likely that the, the journal itself will require the data to be archived. So that's a uh, some degree a no brainer. Uh, and if it doesn't, then it, you might want to archive it anyway. Um, and if you're unsure about um, whether the, the the data is worth archiving, then it, it's it's a good idea to try and ask your principal investigator or um, uh, colleagues um, to see if they uh, if they can give you some some suggestions. Mm. Um, if you have a lot of data, it's worth trying to think how people could uh, use the data and then to try and arrange it in a in a form that uh, that they can. Uh, it makes it easier for them to use. 
Um, then I think for, uh, I looked at the glance of names and I think most of you guys already know about this, but the, uh, if you're storing uh, the formats that you use to store the data, it's um, good to try and choose uh, either widely used uh, formats or open uh, formats that uh, uh, mean that we're not locked into a particular um, um, uh, vendor for that uh, to, to, to be able to um, read that uh, format. Um, and finally, uh, we should also uh, think about uh, the license that um, we should apply to our data. Um, and this is important because uh, if we don't put a license on there in principle, uh, it's very restrictive, uh, but um, if we want to try and um, maximize the reuse of our data, then our license should uh, ideally be as, uh, as uh, permissive as possible. Um, and this is something that I certainly can't advise people on, uh, but hopefully the principal investigator, uh, your community, or uh, the uh, um, a research um, um, group in your library may be able to provide some uh, advice on. Um, and there's also, um, they will, may also be able to provide advice on um, issues in, regarding uh, copyright and uh, intellectual property rights as well. <clears throat> so it's a good idea to try and get those things uh, figured out before uh, you start to, to archive the data. Uh, and then archiving, and uh, in our case, it's, uh, it requires you to um, essentially fill in some metadata and then to upload the data. <clears throat> so just a, a note, I did <laughs> happily noticed that uh, before I uh, started that, um, uh, that some people had asked questions about the, um, uh, the different, uh, some confusing uh, metadata terms in the archive. So hopefully, I try to address these here uh, because I, I understand they are confusing. So uh, the creator of the data set is the people or the groups that actually created the data in the, in the first place. Um, and these will be the people and the groups that will be cited uh, when the data is being is, is reused. Uh, so in, in somebody's uh, subsequent publication, they will may cite your data in these and the people and the creators will be the only people that will be uh, uh, cited alongside of the DOI. Uh, the depositor is the person that is uh, actually putting the data into the archive. It doesn't have to be a, a creator, it could be, could be anyone. Uh, the data manager and the right holder, which is the one that's more confusing. So this, uh, what we were thinking about is uh, that this is a contact person or organizing um, or a person in an organization that will be able to uh, field questions about the data or point to the right person's contact or um, uh, that has questions about the data. If you imagine you're, uh, when you're publishing a, uh, a paper and you've got a, uh, quite a few authors on the paper, then you have a contact person for the paper who would be able to, if you have questions about the um, uh, the material presented, you'd be able to ask that person and they would be able to find the right person to uh, uh, to address that question. So that's what we uh, are hoping that the data manager would be able to do. And uh, similarly, the rights holder, uh, again, it should be ideally be a contact person uh, or uh, 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 someone in the organisation that will be able to field um, questions or points to um, the um, people that would be able to answer questions about copyright and uh, uh, an IPR. <clears throat> and uh, it is difficult to figure out who should, uh, who you should put uh, as these people. Uh, it's worth asking your principal investigator research uh, office if you're unsure of who to put down as the data manager and the rights holder. Ideally, it should be somebody that, um, if it's a, 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 um, a student, uh, it, perhaps it's um, because usually they um, move on to better things after uh, uh, two or three years. So it might be um, worth looking for uh, somebody that's um, uh, uh, 
more uh, long term long term contracts than, than them. Um, so we can archive, as I said, large and small data sets. Um, large data is for the small data sets. If they reside in your local machine, then you can use the web interface to archive the data. It's okay for um, less than 10 gigs uh, data sets. Uh, there can be problems archiving um, a file uh, as well as a tar or zip file. That, that tends to be problematic. Um, if you have uh, large data sets, larger data sets that are not uh, stored on NEARD um, and you want to archive that data, then, then get hold of us and we will uh, figure out a way to do it. Typically, either that uh, entails using something like File Sender or, or MinIO. <clears throat> if you have larger data sets, then um, if they reside on NEARD, then your um, uh, in the project area, then Thierry's uh, cron job will uh, be able to uh, find your data sets and uh, to archive it uh, relatively easily. Um, things to be careful of uh, uh, that we've uh, experienced in the, in the past is um, uh, to make sure that you uh, that your user account has permission to uh, to access the data that you want to archive. Uh, and also that there are ideally no um, soft links uh, in the data that are pointing to storage, which is um, uh, not visible to the uh, to the uh, the project area storage. <clears throat> and if your data sets are pretty large, um, it, it's nice if you're able to let us know um, before before you start to archive. Just uh, we won't stop you from archiving, but it's, it's just so that we can plan ahead and make sure that we have um, uh, there are no outages planned or this uh, we can uh, take care of your uh, your data for you. Uh, and if your data isn't on NEARD, again, uh, contact us so we can uh, figure out how to put your, uh, your data into the archive. And finally, um, <laughs> everybody makes mistakes, so I really wouldn't worry about uh, uh, I certainly wouldn't beat yourself up over if, if you make a mistake in your uh, in archiving the data. Uh, just uh, drop us a message, and we'll we'll help you to to figure out how to um, uh, how to fix it or sort it out. Um, so there's the the email address for us, and there's the uh, the URL for the archive. And yes, I'm over time. Um, there you go. I'm done. Thank you, Adam. Are there any questions to Adam? You can voice it out also if you don't have anything on the talk. I couldn't find any question. I think everything is good. Thank you for joining us, Adam. It was great to have you here. Yeah, before we go for the break, we have one more session and then we will have a break and uh, open question and answer session as well. So it is going to be Andreas, uh, who will talk about the object storage on the new net, which we put in production soon. Yeah. Can you hear me, Andreas? I can hear you. Uh, I yeah. see Sada is sharing presentation for me. Yes. Um, so this is going to be a probably a, a very small one, but um, there seems to be some confusion at least to the people I've talked about just what is object storage. And it is, I found this um, from Wikipedia, which in a way sums it up very neatly. Object storage, also known as object-based storage, is a computer data storage that manages data as objects, as opposed to other storage architectures like file systems, but manages data as a file hierarchy. This is what people usually used to when they think of NILD. Or simply as block storage, which is what we use underneath file systems again. Each object typically includes data, a variable amount of metadata, and a globally unique identifier. So you have something very, very simple. Um, it is just objects with a sort of address that you can look it up. Um, next slide. Amazon S3, or simple storage, 
service that they provide. These are the ones that um, started this thing. It's been a service for quite a while. It is uh, object storage that is made available over the over normal internet technology like uh, REST um, API. So you can use any sort of thing that can talk um, to, to a web page really to contact it, but it's also cumbersome. So we usually use something, some tools to make this easier for us. But it is over web API and that makes it different. Um, it's also, because this called a okay, cloud storage. Um, yeah, next. So for the S3 service that we are implementing, um, it is an API that will be compatible to a large extent to the Amazon S3. We're using OpenStack's own service called Swift. More specifically, since this is an IBM Spectrum Scale product, it's what they provide. Um, if you have some very specific API calls that you need supported. It's not given that we actually support them. So for that, I would look at the docs for Swift, but the usual ones that you would expect with um, objects and buckets, post put, make buckets, etc., will be supported. The endpoint that is going to be used, um, at least I think so, is what I've written, yes, s3.nil.sigma2.no. And IPM offers something that they call a unified object and file access. Um, now, since objects are not something that fits in the file hierarchy, the thing that the IPM has made here is um, in a way a program that tries to map between what is in a bucket and to give it a reasonable file path that is readable and not just this is the uh, the global unique identifier which aren't exactly very human readable um next now people have their own tools to talk with S3. Um, so there are a bunch of them. Um, I don't think I know if we're gonna support any certain kind of tool, but people might have been some uh, experience with uh, Amazon's own command line utility, um, which is just called AVS. Although it does a lot of more than just S3, you can use it to talk to a lot of different S3 services. And since I noticed that it was mentioned, what is access key and what is access secret? Uh, uh, since this is a very simple thing, it doesn't really have a concept of users or anything. So it uses these um, access keys sort of as a mapping to a user or a group or anything, but it really it's this the ones who know the access key and also have the secret are able to interact with um, that bucket or endpoint. Um, um, and what I put here in the slide is a very simple example of how something like this could look like. Um, there are more and um, but some of those things are more specific to Amazon's own service and not so interesting for our part. When it says region US East one, um, a lot of the people trying to implement a S3 service have to somehow make something up about what is the region. And since US East one is the default, that's what is expected. But um, don't worry too much about that. This um, you can take next one. This is just some very quick examples of how something could look like um, with this tool. 
ADS S3 to say we are using the S3 API. Although that's not entirely true since there are more than just the S3, but sure. MP, make bucket. You need to say where the endpoint is. And at the time we didn't have working SSL, but we do now. And then um, um yes, make this um plus bucket. If it's going to be working like this in production, I'm a bit certain because somehow projects need to be mapped into something that makes sense, but sure. Another example, instead of MP for make bucket, CP for copy. Again, it's a path to file and sort of rules saying you want, for example, all the rules, all the files within this path go through recursive. But I don't want all of them. I just want to have tar files. So, a bit like the backup thing we talked about earlier, you start by excluding everything and then including. So, so yeah, you can use these tools to sort of be a bit specific of how you would update something. Another one that, um, Support is a simple ls, um, and that's just list what is in your bucket. And because you're using a tool such as ABS, it will take the the raw answers you get from S3 and make it into something that's more presentable. Um, I don't think I have much more than this. But um, I see that a lot of people already are using these um, MinIO. Um, if you are used to using MinIO, then this should not be a very big difference at all. What is not figured out yet is how we're going to um, map individual project into something that makes sense in an S3 kind of interface. Yeah. Thanks, MGS. Uh, maybe the questions, uh, I can ask one question uh, to Lauren as well. Uh, is this uh, service available only for the project who has a location on Data Lake? Uh, you mean the S3 service? Yes. Currently, it's not available to anyone. Yeah. Uh, but when the system is uh, going to be put in place, uh, then it will be available for the uh, for before just having a location on the system. Yes. So it will be okay. an, um, a functionality added on top of the data lake. Yeah. And there was a question regarding Minayo. We are not going to replace Minayo or Native Toolkit uh, for this service. Uh, that, this no, it's not, be, it's not replacing Minayo. It's not, uh, in, it's not intending to replace Minayo. It, it is actually intending to give direct access to, to the storage itself from from the S3 interface, but uh, in a way you could you could even have parallelly both this and I mean I instance in the uh, toolkit. So, um, but yeah, this is correct. It's just a matter of the endpoints. Um, I would like to say that uh, there would be. That we would have good benchmarks of how the MinIO compares to Swift, but until we actually have this up and running and can test this in a way that looks like production, then it's hard to say that you should choose one or the other. But if you have something that works now and you're happy with it, there's no rush. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I see that you are sharing, Sarja. Could you go down and? Uh... We can have a break before the Q and A. So I have uh, started a poll here just to give your answer if this was a, a, a introduction was useful. Mm, then give us type an O, yes or no. And if there is something you think we should improve or something you like, uh, just let us know. It would be nice to have your feedback. Uh, we had done this uh, training in a busy schedule. Uh, there is things uh, we can improve further if you give us feedback. 
So the, the Lauren, Sada, and Andreas, uh, shall we take a break until quarter to two and then have this open Q and A where we can stop recording and if people want to voice out uh, something, we can take it. Are you all okay with that? Yes. yes. That sounds good to me. Yeah, great. Um, Adil and uh, Siri, Tiri, I also uh, expect you here because if there is any question, you can take it. Um, yeah, thank you. And I will stop the recording, but we'll be back uh, quarter to two and we will have an open question and answer session. Thank you for joining and uh, we'll be back soon.